So long-term outlook for multifamily is still favorable. By and large, the fundamentals are still performing. There are some underlying challenges that will impact the near-term profitability. Welcome to Buzz House, a Baker Tilly podcast where you can find all the buzz around multifamily housing. I'm Don Bernard, the partner in charge of Baker Tilly's multifamily housing practice. And I'm Garrett Gibson, a partner at Baker Tilly, also specializing in consulting on multifamily housing transactions across the country. Each week, we'll bring you a guest or a topic in the multifamily housing industry that will help you win now and anticipate tomorrow. Let's get started. We welcome back into the Buzz House today to give some highlights from his team's quarterly report, which covers multifamily housing, among, of course, other real estate asset classes. Uh, Brent Mayer, a colleague of ours here, of course, at Baker Tilly, who's a principal in charge of Baker Tilly's Transaction Advisory Group. Brent, welcome back. Very glad to have you on today. Thanks for having me. As I noted, Brent is a repeat guest here in the Buzz House. So we're going to take time with him to see what's going on, uh, what he observed, he and his team observed in quarter three here of 2022 in the multifamily housing industry. Before diving into that discussion, a few uh, legislative and industry updates. We have a, a handful of quick updates here. Of course, as we wrap up the year, Congress is working to negotiate final year-end legislation, including a potential tax package, which everyone in this industry is watching closely. There are two key provisions that the affordable housing industry is pushing. If we recall at the end of 2021, a small but meaningful increase in the housing credit expired, the 12.5% of additional credits. Therefore, in 2022, we actually had less credit resources than there had been in the preceding years. This 12.5% increase had been in place since Congress struck a bipartisan agreement back in 2018. The ask is to increase the 9% supply by 50% that had been in the Tax Credit Improvement Act, but at bare minimum, the ask for Congress is to reinstate the 12.5% cut uh, to the 9% Housing Credit Authority adjusted for inflation. So that's number one. The second item is a topic that Garrick and I have discussed many times on the show. Of course, this is the requirement that 50% of the cost of rental housing properties must be financed with multifamily bonds uh, for four percent deals. Of course, in many states, they're running out of this existing bond authority, so the much-needed demand is not being met. The ask for Congress is to lower the bond financing threshold from 50% to 25% to make more efficient use of existing bond resources and significantly expand rental housing production. There have been estimates that that these two changes could increase housing, you know, million, two million units over the next 10 years. So very, very significant. Talk to your legislators. It's a very uh, two very important pieces of legislation. Now I'm going to jump just to a bunch of kind of news and updates from around the industry. Many of you have seen, uh, although not housing specifically, but the new market tax credit program, the applications just came out. Uh, this next round for 2022 will be $5 billion of allocation available. The deadline for community development entity certification is December 2nd, and the actual uh, applications are due January 26 of 2023. In other news, HUD published a Federal Register notice designating 2023 DDAs, or Difficult to Develop Areas, and QCTs. Of course, if you're in a DDA or QCT, you may increase your eligible basis by up to 30%. Note that if you were underwriting your deal that in 2022 uh, haven't closed yet and were underwriting a QCT that now went away in 2023, there are provisions and, and ways to preserve that QCT, so please reach out to Garrick and I or your other other professionals to see how to preserve a QCT that may no longer be there. Also, uh, HUD recently published a notice in the Federal Register establishing operating cost adjustment factors, or OCAFs, for eligible multifamily housing properties. Like we've seen many rent increases uh, across the past year, the average increase in OCAFs is 6.1%, from a low of 4.8 in South Dakota to a high of 8.3 in Maine. The 2022 rate was just at 3.1%. Historically, right, it's been around that 3% level. Of course, much of this is due to the historically high inflation rates. And HUD actually calculated the cost component for most of these components uh, using a period longer than a year. Uh, HUD will revert to year-over-year data going forward. Lastly, uh, before we get into our discussion with Brent, uh, interesting article. I always like to look at articles, you know, disproving kind of theories and stigmas around affordable housing. An article in the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel reports on a new study from UCLA that sought to disprove theories that housing voucher recipients bring crime to neighborhoods. The study specifically examined the fear that voucher recipients attract crime 
a stigma that persists, obviously, despite a, a clear lack of evidence. The study does, in fact, disprove these theories. Uh, again, it's always interesting to find, you know, property values, crime and things like that. But many studies from from higher ed and so forth kind of disprove these theories. Now I'm going to turn over to Garrett to jump into our conversation with Brent. Thanks, Don. Thanks for that update. And Brent, obviously, you know, you've been on here many times before, but for our new listeners to the podcast, would you give a brief background of your career and role here at Baker Tilly? Sure. And again, thanks, Don and Garrick, for uh, having me on today. Yes. Yeah, so I uh, was at an investment bank for over 10 years, almost 15 years, actually, where we did a lot of real estate transactional work. And here we provide valuation and advisory services to real estate owners, investors, and users typically in and around transactions to assist clients as part of their acquisition or reporting process with services such as due diligence, modeling, site selection, valuations, appraisals, and portfolio strategy. Awesome. Thanks for that. So let's jump right in. So Brent, what did the numbers look like for construction cost increases during the third quarter? And how did that trend for the year and then this year compared to the same time last year? Also, what did you find regarding supply chain and labor availability? Sure. So construction costs, you know, the bad news is construction costs, again, increased in the third quarter. The good news is not nearly the pace that it was increasing earlier in the year. So construction costs are up, but um, it's decelerating or or slowing down in terms of how much it's increasing. So we're kind of expecting that number to come in 10% for 2022 over 2021. In 2021, we saw an increase of uh, over 13%. So still over these two years, it's a substantial increase for our construction costs. Um, And as far as uh, supply chain and labor availability, it's it's still posing challenges in terms of both those items. So it's it's going to be an interesting 2023. Brent, thanks for that. You know, kind of switching to rent growth. Obviously, we've seen really unprecedented rent growth in in 2021 coming into 2022. You know, what what are we seeing here now? We're in the third quarter. Is recession around 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 the bend? Interest rates. What's what's going on with rent growth? And again, how does that compare with you know the last year and historically? So similar to construction costs, rent growth has also decelerated in the year. Through September, um, rent growth for the year was just under 7% compared to 2021, which was the highest year on record where rent growth was over 17%. So 2022 looks and feels more like it was historically pre-COVID or pre-pandemic. And so I think we're going to see rent growth come down in the near term. So in in staying in touch with that rent increase, because I know we had that really large 2021 rent increase and overall had continued increases into 2022. But what does the data show about bad debt and renters that are who who are behind on payments, uh, given those increases? Yeah, uh, clearly, clearly it's up. Um, and many of our clients are watching, you know, both bad debt and delinquency closely given the expected recession, uh, right, and the immediate impact on the bottom line for their properties. Um, the September household pulse survey indicated over one third of tenants or borrowers were at risk for eviction or foreclosure. And while many of these will be resolved before becoming an issue, it will take a lot of work and time to digest these numbers. So this will obviously impact the profitability for these properties going into 23. Definitely keep our eyes on that. Brian, of course, uh, Garrick and I, you know, deal with many affordable housing transactions and 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 policy and legislation. But I think it seems some some trend in how, you know cities are what you know cities are looking at what they can do. And, and I know your report addresses a little bit of you know maybe you're seeing a little bit more about rent controls as a way for municipalities to try and keep rental rates in check. Do you have what maybe a couple? Thoughts or what, what do you observe on that? Well, I, I wouldn't say it's a wave of, of activity, but certainly we are noticing and seeing, you know, more of these in the headlines. Um, you know, federal and local governments are obviously concerned with the affordability for housing. Um, so there has been a number of measures on the ballots and in legislatures to address this, um, mostly through rent controls. Uh, for example, Orange County, Florida passed a resolution to cap rent. St. Paul, Minnesota already has that in place, and they're looking to bolster that uh, rent control. While other areas, um, they're they're more in the proposal process, such as Tampa, St. Petersburg, and others. 
So we have seen an increase in activity around rent control. Yeah, I think that's interesting. And and so, you know, I guess we can end with our discussion on multifamily. Um, we obviously know there's challenges right now in pretty much all the real estate asset classes. But, you know, given what we've discussed with collection issues, bad debt and higher construction costs on new projects, and then obviously interest rate hikes and they, they keep going up. What is the actual outlook for the multifamily sector? So long-term outlook for multifamily is still favorable. By and large, the fundamentals are still performing. There are some underlying challenges that will impact the near-term profitability. And those would include headwinds such with inflation, right, which directly impacts the tenants, um, the rising cost of debt. So to get transactions done or new construction is challenging. Obviously, huge construction costs over the last couple of years However, the, there are tailwinds, right? So a demographic shift to renting longer with the cost of debt increasing, mortgage rates are, are high, you know, which make it more difficult to enter the, uh, the housing market, as well as the shortage of uh, multifamily units uh, that are out there. So I would say the long-term outlook is favorable. I mean, there's just going to be, you know, some choppy waters here in the near term. Very good. Brent, really appreciate the updates, kind of some of those observations. It's always good to hear kind of on a, on a, on a holistic view. So thanks again for joining us. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. Very good listeners. Thank you for tuning in as well. Thank you for listening to Buzz House. To receive a notification when new episodes are available, please subscribe to Buzz House, a Baker Tilly podcast, wherever you get your podcasts. For additional resources around multifamily housing, check out bakertilly.com. And if you have a suggested topic, please send them to build at bakertilly.com. That's B-U-I-L-D at bakertilly.com.